we do try to do it as efficiently and safely as possible because uh, things go wrong and it's not a good thing when you're dealing with explosives. The blasters map out the detonation site. It's more than a half kilometer long plot. They follow a plan called the blast pattern that shows where to place the explosives. Today's blast pattern has almost 200 holes. The blasters plant each with about 800 kilograms of explosives. Enough ammonium nitrate to rip a man to pieces and turn granite into flying shrapnel. The detonation will demolish about 50,000 tons of rock, a huge chunk of the pit face. To see how big that is, watch as everyone clears the pit. The last truck out crosses right over the demolition zone. It looks like an ant on a highway. Now, blast time. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's see that again. A main detonation wire links the fuses on each of the blast holes. As the main line burns down, the explosives ignite in a flash of red like a string of firecrackers. Blast tears a massive chunk of kimberlite and granite from the pit, food for the beasts looming outside. Next, step three, shovel, starring the King Kong of Akati, the D-Mag. This brute is the first mega machine back into the danger zone, ready to devour the remains. The D-Mag is an insatiable monster. Every hour its bucket or clam scoops up to 4,500 tons of kimberlite, the equivalent of 900 school buses. It has to move fast. The operator has just five seconds to load his bucket and just 30 seconds between dumps. This heavy lifting requires brawn and brains. As the D-Mag shovels, it sculpts the pit face. Using its full four stories of height, the D-Mag pulls away the crumbled rock, starting at the bottom of the pile and carefully scraping up. One false move and tons of unstable rock could come pouring down the cliff and a granite landslide is an ugly way to go. Just in case, the D-Mag has an armoured windshield and a dead man switch to cut the engine if the situation gets out of control. Step 4. Hauling with the cat. Where there's a D-Mag, you're always sure to find its accomplice, the cat, ready to carry off the loot. The cat is the team's champion weightlifter. It catches four full scoops from the D-Mag before filling up. The cat's designed to catch punishing loads. An eight-degree V-slope bed gently receives unstable loose rock and shifts it to the bed's center. This protects the cat from losing its balance during loading, an important feature when the mega trucks hauling 218 tons of diamond studded rock. That's like carrying three dozen elephants. Few other dump trucks on earth can handle such a heavy load. Hugging the steep access road, the cat prowls to its final destination. Step 5. Processing. The process plant is the heart of Akati's mining operation. It's here that diamonds and dirt part company. 
This is a non-stop operation, processing 12,000 tons of kimberlite ore a day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. At the plant, the diamond-bearing ore is crushed and scrubbed, ground and sorted. In the final stage, the diamonds are recovered via x-ray machines and grease tables. From this, the plant yields about one diamond carat per tonne of ore. That's about a coffee can of diamonds a day. It may not sound like much, but at that rate, Akati extracts about five million carats of diamonds a year. The rough stones are then cut and polished and sent to Belgium to be sorted and sold. As the mega movers push ahead in the fox pit, deep underground, the panda team moves closer to their goal. A band of unique subterranean machines have been constructing the tunnel for months. The tunnel is a narrow five meter wide passage stretching down to the Kimberlite pipe, only 40 meters in diameter. A conveyor belt will bring the ore directly to the process plant. If this were to scale, the tunnel would look like a thread. Tunnel construction is always challenging work, but the Panda Tunnel is harder than most. It will be extremely long, more than two kilometers. At that length, getting the tunnel to line up with its target is a high-stakes feat of engineering. Even the slightest miscalculation in direction can take on troublesome proportions over a two-kilometer course. And this tunnel must be completely straight or the conveyor belt can't be installed. To make matters worse, down here, compasses aren't accurate. Instead, engineers must rely on charts and graphs. Above ground, the machines win with muscle, but underground, precision and accuracy are what counts. The engineers regularly check coordinates. At the moment, the tunnel looks spot on. We've got a test hole, and from the test hole indications, uh, the line is bang on, and the elevation seems to be pretty close to where we should be. As the team digs towards the hidden treasure, the Akati camp braces against an approaching deadline. The mine depends on the outside world for supplies, but a change of season is about to force their supply road to close. The next few days are Akati's last chance to haul in most of the crucial supplies the machines need to pull off their missions. Without the right equipment, the mega movers won't make it through the months ahead. Akati is one of the most remote diamond mines on Earth. Located in Canada's Northwest Territories, it's just 200 kilometers below the Arctic Circle. The closest city is Yellowknife, over 300 kilometers away. Keeping Akati and its monster machines rolling is like taking an army to the dark side of the moon. Mega parts, fuel, building materials, everything has to be shipped in. Everything. It's a huge job requiring a fleet of monster trucks. They're called super bees, and they can haul 80 tons in a single load. But there's only one road to Akati, the ice road. It's made almost entirely of frozen lakes and marshlands. The road can only be used for a brief 8 to 12 weeks in late winter, when the ice is thickest. The rest of the year, the weather's simply too warm. The frozen lakes melt and the marshland becomes dangerously soft, unable to bear the weight of the super bees. This means the trucks have just two months to haul a year's worth of the most critical supplies to the camp. If they fall short, the mega movers won't have what they need to run and the mine could face a shutdown. Now, with spring right around the corner, the final convoys embark on a risky trip across thinning ice. The loads that are coming now are priority loads that have to get in, that can't be flown. 
the trucks are loaded with critical supplies. Ammonium nitrate to blast the frozen rock and a special Arctic grade fuel to keep the mega movers running in the subarctic. It's an explosive payload, made even more dangerous by the ice road's deteriorating condition. After just two months of use, it's torn up from the heavy freight trucks. This last caravan will have to be careful not to put too much weight on the ice road at once or risk crashing through. So the Super Bs travel in small groups of four. They drive a kilometer apart to give the road time to heal. As we're rolling along, um, you're fracturing the ice and there's cracking and, and, and there's taking place. And with a kilometer apart, you get a chance for the ice to heal a little bit and also doesn't put too much weight in any one spot. Fifteen hours later, they roll into Akati. The dangerous run has gone off without a hitch. But there's a development at the mine. The mighty DMAG, the super shovel, is showing signs of slowing down. In this killing cold, maintenance is a must. The mega movers undergo routine checkups about once a month. It's the only way to protect the machines from the damaging weather. This clam or bucket, we've got probably close to a foot of steel, a foot thick, in the, uh, in the base of this bucket. And in extreme cold, it can crack it right out. We can drop those teeth off very easily, just snap off a tooth like a carrot, and uh, then we're in all sorts of trouble. Gary Ayres supervises maintenance at Akati. He pulls the DMAG out of action for a scheduled tuna. But he and his team must work fast. They have just 48 hours to diagnose and fix the mega mover. Any longer, and the cold can seriously damage the machine. They've got a lot to do, and even small jobs become mega work on a machine this big. Try getting an oil change on a machine that uses over 10,000 litres. Next, lubing all of the joints. The DMAG has hundreds. In this extreme cold, the grease on the joints freezes and loses its lubricant quality. If a joint goes too long without new grease, catastrophic failure occurs. The moving parts create so much friction, they weld together and lock in place. As one team tackles the joints, experts focus in on a damaged cylinder. A falling rock dented the metal. The casing could spill oil, a huge environmental hazard. The DMAG can't work until the cylinder is replaced. The maintenance crews get to work. Without a DMAG, the diamonds won't dig themselves. While the fox pit slows down, below ground the fearless panda tunnel team surges ahead. The beasts that dwell down here are specially designed for such conditions. Long, flat, compact. The scoop tram. The haul truck and the powerful jumbo drill. These are the underground cousins of the giants that work the fox pit. But instead of brute force, these machines rely on precision planning to reach the diamonds. They're the elite safe crackers of the mining world. And this dangerous environment demands a careful strategy. Their first move, punching holes for the explosives. The 20-ton jumbo drill pounds into the granite. This machine has two muscular drilling boots, so it can do the work of two drills at once. The jumbos create 54-meter holes, just enough to blow out nearly 70 cubic meters. Now it's time for the...